Uh, welcome to the second episode of Women Tech Makers. So we first started Women Tech Makers around Google I.O. back in May. It was so well received. So we mm. decided to bring back a week-long series of five amazing and fabulous women to talk about their experience in the tech industry. So today we have a special guest, Mary Lou Jepson. Um, before we get started, let me quickly introduce myself. So I head up our global Chrome developer relations team. So our mission is to teach web developers how to build great web apps. So it has been great experience working on the most amazing products with the most amazing team. So I'm joined by Jean. Hi, everybody. My name is Jean Wang. I'm a lead hardware engineer at uh, Google X Project Glass. And please for excuse me today for not wearing my uh, glass device. It's currently charging. And I'm really excited to have Mary Lou with us here today. Um, she's spearheaded a number of display technologies, including micro display, which is actually near and dear to our hearts at Google X as well. Mary Lou, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'm Mary Lou Jepson, and I, I just want to correct, I think there's 15 amazing women. So you guys, uh, all the amazing uh, hardware people at Google and, and software and technology people at Google. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. I'm big fans of yours. Uh, my background, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Pixel Chi, which is a spin out of a previous organization I cre uh, co founded with Nicholas Negroponte called One Laptop Per Child, where I architected the $100 laptop. And it turns out that there was a lot of great technology in that laptop. It wasn't just a cheap laptop, so much so that the CEOs of some of the big device makers of the world really wanted the low power management and screen architectures that I had developed for this thing, the $100 laptop. And so I spun out and I created a for-profit company called Pixel Chi, where we've now shipped about 3 million different units across using the, fa in using the excess fab capacity of the world's LCD fabs to create really innovative screen architecture that's really low power. For that, I founded a micro display company and I was a professor at MIT for a mm -hmm. while and so forth. But Can you talk a bit more about that evolution and trajectory in your professional life and how it's gotten to where you are today with Pixel G? Ah, sure. Uh, I um, really liked art and I really liked math. <laughs> and it turned out that Matt, um, with some push from my parents to be an electrical engineering major because they wanted me to be able to get a job when I graduated. I had The deal was they would help me pay for college if I got a double E degree, but I, I found the first couple years of double E pretty, pretty stifling. Like mm -hmm. they would have, if I had any creativity, it would have crushed it. So to sort of maintain my sanity, I kept my art going and got a pretty much a degree in art as well at the same time. And that combined itself for me First in holography, I started doing 3D things with, with lasers and stuff and holographic video and just different display technologies. So I just really like doing a technically really hard puzzle and kind of the reward is this beautiful image at the end. So that's what I do now. Great. Can you talk a bit about the current state of the hardware industry then in terms of the display and where you see it going? Yeah, it's a really interesting. It's a um, Trauma is a nice way to put it. I mean, right now there's not a single profitable display manufacturer in the world. They're running at negative 20% margin. They have been for a number of years. I think Sharp just forecasted they're going to lose $6 billion this mm -hmm. fiscal year. Panasonic worse, nearly $10 billion. Um, negative 20% margin for a number of years is hard to maintain, right? It's, it's actually geopolitical. China's building up more manufacturing capacity and there's just excess capacity. So there's that. And then in the device space, Apple and Samsung have executed very, very well, as I think duh, everybody knows that. What, what maybe doesn't sort of make the stage as sort of pronounced is that everybody else, HP, Dell, Nokia, RIM, you know, Asus, Acer, are running at nearly just about break even. And you know, a lot of R&D has been slashed. And so there's, there's just very few innovative, you're doing one of the most innovative hardware programs on the planet yourself, but there's just very, very little of that today. You know, I think Andreasen says software eats the world, that's great, but it still has to run on something, you know, and there's still this device, and if it's all Apple something, you know, God help us, because they're going to control the whole stream of data. Like, we, we need, I think, more diversity, and 
we're searching for that. I like Apple product, I like, you know, all of them, but I just, I think it's more interesting if there was more than just two companies shipping devices mm -hmm. in huge volumes. Right. So how is Pixel G and how are you doing your part to try to make the display industry profitable? Well, um, displays, even when I designed this thing, the, the reason I created a new screen was, was cost, but it was also power. In the developing world, kids don't have power outlets in the wall, or if they do, they're not on all the time. So we made, this is a one watt laptop. The next laptop up is about 10 watts. And that comes from a lot of the power management architecture that we created. So what are we doing is, is, is continuing that march down in a world where, since I made this, the power consumption of screens has quadrupled in the last three to four years. This is in a world where Intel will respin a chip to save 10 milliwatts. Qualcomm will, will fight about microwatts. Mm -hmm. And the screen power consumption has gone up like five watts. You know, if you look at like an iPad 3, Apple's sort of one of their flagship products, it's a nine watt machine, eight watts of that is taken by the screen. So what we've figured out how to do is how to basically take seven watts out of that. Not seven milliwatts, not seven microwatts, seven watts, while maintaining the front of screen performance, including the um, resolution and so forth, viewing angle, color saturation, contrast, and all of that. So that's our next generation architecture. But we've done that by building up, starting with this screen in here that's sunlight readable, and really working on um, basically what I call small aperture pixels. As, as you increase the screen resolution, if the transistor stays the same size, it takes up more and more of the pixel area. That means the light from the backlight gets blocked and can't get through, and so you gotta crank up that backlight, and you gotta power all those extra pixels. Power is a huge deal. It's, 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 it's maybe it's not even power, it's thermal management. It's how, how, what do you do with the heat? You can use the best batteries you want, but even still, the iPad 3 is, is overheating, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's the thermal budget. And so if the, pix if the pixels are getting smaller and the transistors stay the same size and you crank it up, all that power goes to the screen rather than a zippier processor, multitasking, being able to beam video around, being able to beam video to Google Glass, you know, whatever. You can use power for a lot of different things if the screen isn't hogging it. So we're working on that problem. And what we've done is over the last eight years, increase the front of screen performance. So now we can match that of OLED or, you know, any of the, you know, whatever, the Android screens or the Motorola, you know, I don't mean to just pick on Apple, but at a competitive, you know, um, screen performance, including the contrast, color, viewing angle, resolution, and so mm -hmm. forth. So that's what we've been uh, doing. Is uh, one laptop per child, that laptop, is also continue to improve the screen display? Because I know, I read recently, they also start having the tablets. Yes, so we're yeah. designing the screen for the tablet, and we have improved the front of screen performance of this. And I, oh, I just turned it off. Um, I'll turn it back on. Um, but you can see, and I have brought a big flash, flashlight to show you. But yeah, so one laptop per child, uh, I developed a screen for it, and we continue to support them. When I created Pixel Chi, it was sort of like a, it was a spin-off from a hard, hardware charity, a nonprofit. And so we did a cross-licensing deal where we get the IP, all the patent stuff from one laptop per child to use to continue to develop. And we give them access to all, all of our IP that we invent forever for their nonprofit humanitarian goals. So it's, it's a good, we still you know, support them also with finding vendors and things, in, especially in Asia. I spend mm -hmm. most of my time in Asia, mm -hmm. so yeah. It's really impressive about the power savings. Can you talk about that discovery process and how you invent these new architectures to achieve uh, the savings and oh, yeah. disadvantage? How do you invent? Um, I guess this came from you know this. If you, if you think of this, I've got it back up, and I can show you that you know. So I've got a big flashlight, and I can show that it's this is the brightest flashlight on the planet that you can carry. On a, on a plane, and so you can see it's, it's sunlight readable. And so it came from sort of thinking about really wanting e-ink, but with, and that's like compared to my sun, supposedly sunlight readable Nokia um, Lumia phone. Uh, it, it, I think, you know, this one, how do you invent in general, is uh, 
you try a lot, throw a lot of ideas um, and see what sticks, I think, um, and work through. And, you know, I just think about it all the time. I can't mm -hmm. sleep. I wake up. You know, in this case, the kids had to get their laptops. How are you going to solve it? Oh, my gosh. So, I, like, it was like falling in love almost, complete with, like, not being able to sleep past 3 in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, and waking up and thinking, how am I, you know, how am I going to do it? How, 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 how do we do it? So... Um, but this is a, the progression of this screen to our next screens and our next screens came from sort of a, a point of discovery. We'd figured out how to make a really good small aperture screen because we wanted to use most of the pixel to reflect the light. Mm -hmm. Like why fight the sun, why not use it? And so we developed an architecture where we could hide a lot of circuitry underneath the, the, those mirrors. We added a, we got rid of one layer on the top substrate and added a layer to the bottom substrate. And that, it wasn't obvious to me that that could make a large difference in where, where other screen technology was going, but we've actually created a, lo a lot of different IP around, around that idea to solve a lot of our customers' problems and a lot of the problems that we want to solve as we invent new screens. I guess I'm not really answering the question, though. Like, how do, how do you invent? I, I don't know. I just like needling on problems. Yeah. But. I think some of it's, of course, you do it off on your you know, own when you're sleeping, perhaps dreaming about it, or just having lunch by yourself. And oftentimes you just have brainstorms with people that you work with and from diverse perspectives, right? So yes. optics team plus the product design team plus the AA team getting together in one room with manufacturing and just figuring out what are the key issues that we have currently and what can we do to attack it from a perspective we never thought of before. Yeah. So there's some of that. But I, I also like the hard criticism. I mm. find out more <laughs> about about right. that when people tell me the things they don't like right. about what I did. How come you didn't, you know, especially if it's something new. And and sometimes they won't tell you that to your face. I think, you know, Vinod Kosla has said his Twitter stream is very valuable mm. for finding out what people really think about him. But, you know, they'll, they'll post it in blogs and different things sometimes because there's it's just grown so much. Every little knit, you know, people... You know, fan boys too, even yeah. for Pixel Chi, and they say what they like and what they're frustrated with. And when I hear their frustrations, and I, I think, huh, how could we fix that? Or, you know, yeah, the intersection of things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, sometimes I just dream about it and wake up and it's solved, yes. <laughs> yes. It's a nice case <laughs> if it all happens all the time. Um, so, all of these things are great advantages for the technology. Are there any disadvantages that you can share with us? Disadvantages. Um, I suppose for for me the 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 big you know uh, the big sacrifices I've made are just basically living on a plane and giving up having a life <laughs> you know like yeah. when you start a company or when we started one laptop per child you know forget about kind of friends family <laughs> all of that so those are the the sacrifices that it mm -hmm. seems to take because you have to work on other people's schedules and the time zone thing is so great and the travel time is so great that it's pretty hard to figure out, you know, when the factory is going to be down in advance, because you have to be there with immediately mm -hmm. if there's an issue. And so, um, disadvantages of our technology, or I suppose disadvantages of our technology. Um, today, we've sort of we started with lower front of screen performance on some level, although it's more readable, which should matter because reading is books may disappear, but reading's not probably going to disappear anytime soon. Um, but you know, Apple, Apple communicates with its customers very well. So whatever Apple says matters, that's what matters. Didn't used to be important to be able to read a screen like that, but now it is, because Apple said it was. So you have to, we all have to do that. I'm really grateful that Apple, you know, a lot of us in, in the display community and hardware community for, for a long time have wanted higher resolution. And I always spent the 500 bucks extra <laughs> to buy something with high resolution. But now Apple has communicated effectively to its customers that resolution matters, so everybody knows resolution matters. So that's, I think, it's a world um, where, out, where a single company calls the shots and the entire industry has slashed its R&D for the past few years and is living at negative 20% margin. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's interesting to work inside of that because we, we, we started during the economic crisis. So we've developed some, some pretty interesting R&D you guys clearly have, but there, there just aren't that many efforts mm -hmm. like that. You see the big software players, you know, Microsoft coming out with hardware 
Amazon, I mean, you know, Android, um, Facebook, you know, entering because they're frustrated. They can't just continue to let Apple eat their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, Dell, HP, Nokia, they all misstepped or Apple executed well, but it doesn't matter. Um, you see people filling in for that. But it's been, um, uh, <laughs> Feel, you know, whatever, walking through the valley of death or something, you know, it feels, it feels a lot like that mm -hmm. um, through, d through this period of time. What, what is your take on Amazon? It seems they are doing pretty well in terms of those devices. Yeah, I mean, th there's an example where screen technology really mattered. I mean, mm -hmm. they, Sony took on Ink, Ink mm -hmm. first, but, but didn't get the content. Sony, of all people, couldn't get the content, but Amazon got the content and um, was able to create, really, you know, spur, catalyze, execute on the ebook reader, you know, the e-reader kind of revolution five years ago now. And now it's come out with, with other things. I think, you know, there's, they're building out more space. There's something like 1,200 people working on different different things and um, you know presume there's a lot of rumors that they're coming out with other sets of devices they've certainly been hiring um, it, mm -hmm. it's that's it's exciting I think um, it's very exciting what is what is Eric Schmidt called the gang of four I don't think that you guys <laughs> actually gang together though it's sort of more competition of four giant companies really seems to be the current landscape and and I don't know, what's your <laughs> view? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm more on the software side of the thing. So um, it's just like a lot of continuous um, innovation. Um, I mean, for us, like Chrome, we have Chromebooks and so on. Just like filling in a market like where people in addition to needing the tablets, which is always on the go, or having a laptop, being able to do um, development or as a kind of task like I found a place for like in my kitchen I use my Chromebooks when I'm doing the cooking so I'm finding the places for all these different devices yeah, yeah. and can you spill on it <laughs> <laughs> it's okay yeah yeah for cooking it's and it's been a dream for a long time that always failed was the cooking menu device so maybe this is it mm. but <laughs> it's an it's an issue well, hopefully with glass, you can uh, cook. The glass. Yeah, you can use glass for cooking. cooking. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at a world in 2020 we'll, where the estimates are there'll be 10 devices per person, and so the charging gets to be, you know, an issue because all of the adapters and sure there's the inductive charging, but that's not mm -hmm. very efficient. Um, and it'd be nicer. I think I, I, I believe the reason I work so hard is I believe we have to get to a world of self-powered devices where um, you have to lower, just like Intel does or Qualcomm or any chip maker in the screen and, and everything, the, the power is so low so that it becomes like a calculator. A small little solar cell is enough to power the whole thing. And I think that we can get there. Solar cells have gotten a lot better, but the screen power consumption now takes 90% of the battery. The battery, it's only a small exaggeration to say the battery in a device is there to power the screen. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that will open up what we can do with things. I like, you know, I, but, you know, take it further. Why can't we exhale the device or spray paint it on the wall and you know peel it off and eat it or you know whatever tattoo it on our bodies or watch you know certainly the healthcare yeah. devices that will come for it there's some you know merger of you know mind and device and ears right there on the head I'm sure you probably yeah, can't talk about a it but definitely <laughs> concern for a glass and to be able to use the device all day is something that we think seriously about and so anything we can reduce th the power from the display point of view or even the electronics, the audio system that we have, all of that is extremely important to work on. Right. And right. we're always on the lookout, you know, not just as a big company, but looking at small companies and innovations there for technology improvement, for battery technology and sure. electronics. So what is the minimal thing we can do to achieve a great user experience? Right. And the battery technology is getting better at about 10% a year. Maybe there's some breakthrough stuff. I mean, there's a lot, some very interesting companies, mm -hmm. and that's good. But we need to also get there's the charge time 
And so if, this, if the device takes more power because it's got a better innovative battery, there's still the charge time to the battery. We're right now, I mean, we all went to, and it's great because we can use our mini USB mm -hmm. adapters on most things, but that really limits the charge time, it's only five volts. And so, you know, it, it, it takes, you know, six, seven hours to charge a typical tablet. In fact, the Motorola Zoom tablet charges faster, which is why OLPC used it for a deployment in Ethiopia, because it's got a 12 volt special adapter, mm -hmm. so it can charge twice as fast. So, you know, like, how do you, can we just make it so that they can self-power some, if you're walking around, why isn't that enough to charge it or a little bit of light? Can we get it down to that, that low? And I think it's certainly possible. It's very key in a lot of the developing world where there isn't steady, ready access to electricity. Uh, you could say, well, that will change. Infrastructure will be developed if you wait 10 years, 20 years. But, you know, some places it's hard to go there and actually believe that it'll be, you know, everybody will have ready access to electricity because then you actually have to think about the global warming, you know, issues mm -hmm. and sort of how much of our electronics um, are now the footprint of our of our energy usage. And in homes it used to be it was the refrigerator that was the most power hungry thing. Now it's the T V, right? And sort of it's ten percent about of the power use in the home is electronics and as we get more electronics that goes up. So there's this whole green level to it, which people don't think of in the first level because you're focused on, you know, transportation being, you know, one of the, the key things. But it's just also just more convenient if you don't have to power mm -hmm. the stuff up. So consumers can, can vote, but there's certainly places where we're, um, we're, we're not really able to compete with Apple or Samsung. They spend, if we, they only spent 10 times what we did, we could, but they spend a thousand <laughs> times what we do. I mean, they spend billions when we spend millions. So we actually have a nice niche in our company. Um, we serve the 130 million people that can't buy um, normal products from Apple, Samsung, or other vendors because they work outside construction workers, military, cops, meter maids, truck drivers, they mm. all need stuff. So we have stuff, you know, like like this. It's kind of a brick, but you can, you know, throw it on the ground and it, and it works or, you know, whatever, spill on it. Oh Sorry. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, um, you know, fine, it just switched because I, but it, you know, you can dunk it and, and different things activate windows now and it's sunlight readable so we have I can even stand on it if you want to see that what, what um, is the uh, uh, special uh, usage of this device is it for the truck driver or this one is actually this is a new product from Trimble and they actually have the surveyors of the world which are a huge they've got like 73 percent of that market so it's mm. it's actually um, data input uh, there's even this in the back so uh, but yeah, I mean, you can use it for anything that you need to be outside. If it's getting mud on it, if, it, you know, if it's something will roll over it, you know, it, you need the ruggedness and the, you need to be able to see it outside for it to be useful. The truth is, if we all stayed inside all the time, it would be okay. But in reality, people go outside. Most of us go outside every day. <laughs> we use our cell phones outside. We use digital cameras outside. You can't even tell if your grandmother is smiling when you take a picture of her. She might not be around that much longer with all of today's devices because you can't see them outside. So we're, you know, doing specialty stuff for professional photographers, but we believe that people will care about that and power and readability um, where, you know, that it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult in an industry that is, um, struggling like it is now mm -hmm. uh, so we we persevere and we're pretty happy about having this large niche we go profitable on this niche but our big ambi ambition is to make innovative screens and in a world where if you graph you know if, if you, it used to be in the year 2000 maybe let's call it 10 million laptops shipped that year there were tablets that shipped Apple didn't even have much smaller numbers and so the volume that you need to, to achieve on a new product was relatively small. Mo fast forward today where you've got, you know, 250, 300 million laptops, same amount of desktops, billion cell phones. When you start mass production, you have to be able to go to a million units a month. That means you have to use an existing factory infrastructure or build your own factory, which costs a couple billion dollars. 
you spend a couple billion dollars to build a factory, you've got to amortize that over the output for whatever, five years. And basically, you know, that's what Qualcomm did. They were basically wrapping a $100 to $500 bill around every product they shipped as a gift to the customer. And so what, what we noticed is that it's a moment, it, pe- it seems to be, in the display industry where it's a lot like 25 years ago in silicon, where there were all these different types of silicon processes. There was CMOS, which won silicon on sapphire, gallium arsenide. And, and CMOS got good enough. It wasn't the best, but it got good enough, where, and the processes reliable enough, where more of those factories were made. And people could basically design a chip in software and send the file to the manufacturer, and back came a chip. So we think it's that moment in the display industry. We're the only fabulous LCD company in the world. We're the only team, external team, that's ever gotten, they still call it tape out. That's how old the nomenclature is back when you had computer tapes. That has gotten to tape out into the big factories in the world. Not even Apple gets that. They get everything for for good reason, mind you. But um, we've been doing that and and basically using as is the factory process windows processes, the materials that are allowed in the fab, and re-architecting every single layer, the liquid crystal, how we drive it, Mm -hmm. um, how we create um, structures. Because basically you're playing with layers of metal and oxide. Oxide, another word for that's glass, right? And metal is a conductor and oxide is an insulator, but metal is also a reflector and oxide is, well, glasses are made out of, there's lenses, right? And so you have to think of shapes that can be both a transistor shape or a line shape and have good, you know, mobility, which is an electron mobility, while t- have playing, you know, a double role to bounce the light where you want the light to go mm-hmm. and in the way that you want it to go. And it's pretty fun. It's a very analog process. We work a lot on like a small pixel, a hundred micron square pixel, and then we make millions of them. We copy it when we nail that pixel. And um, that's that's really what we're trying to do in a world where 97% of all screens are liquid crystal displays using thin film transistors. There are some other movements in the industry. You're leading a fantastic one, Love Alcos, um, or you know any of the micro display technologies. Mm-hmm. That's single crystal silicon, and you can do so much more in the back plane. And that's actually where we came from. My team, actually, a lot of the people in in the company I have now, I started working with in the mid '90s when we started micro displays. And there was a big micro display effort. It was thought that that was going to beat um, direct view HD TV. We lost <laughs> LCD one, but we were developing incredible innovation in the backplane because we had single crystal silicon. We could tape it out to those CMOS fabs. Back would come it the the chip, and we could smear the liquid crystals on them. We built little. Pro, we, I, I had a factory in Richmond, California, with high school kids working in it, where we'd actually, you know, crank out twenty thousand units a month or so f- into head-mounted displays and wristwatch video and stuff like that in the '90s. Uh, unfortunately, nobody bought the head-mounted displays, so that was, you know, we we and so we pivoted to HDTV and, and uh, lost. But what happened was there was this sensibility that was developed of architecture. I think more from that background than um, the, the, the people primarily in Asia who figured out how to do high volume, low cost manufacturing. Basically hang a wall, uh, hang a big you know, picture window TV on the wall. That was a dream for 20 years. It now costs $200 to make a 42 inch TV. So given that, that you know, that's the factory infrastructure that we have, how do we use it to do something more interesting? Not everything has to just be a little TV, right? We need screens. The world's information is digital. The way we access that information is through the screen. And uh, that's why I'm quite fascinated by the work that, that you're doing. I mean, what, what, what can that be if we, and I think, you know, part of it is you can't even get there until you solve the power problem, because as you make these better screens, the power just goes through the roof. Mm-hmm. Long answer, sorry. <coughs> um, I have a slightly unrelated question. I'm just kind of curious. I noticed the company name is Pixel Chi. Yeah. And I'm Chinese, so I can read Chinese. And how? 
Um, <laughs> so I realized that chi actually means air in Chinese. <coughs> so I'm kind of wondering if there's any special story behind the yeah, name sure. of the company. I mean, uh, basically, I, I spend a lot of time doing hard work because we, as it's been well publicized, it's election day through the election. We lost our manufacturing infrastructure in the West. Mm -hmm. It's moved to Asia. So if you do hardware, I was just, I, I spend a lot of time, and people, when I visit a company, they'll give me the English name of the company and the English address, mm -hmm. which is completely useless. You know, pick your country. It's, it's completely useless in, in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, you know. And so, you know, then you, I learned some, I'm not as good as you, but I've learned some Chinese. And um, I just, I like the idea of, of the display is really what's alive. It's the Confucius belief that sort of pan most of Asia of, of the life force in an inanimate object, mm -hmm. right? Because we, the screens are kind of alive. And then also, I just wanted a com company name that was the same in every language. Qi is called Qi in, in Japanese and Kui in Taiwanese, but ah. the symbol is the same, which is steam rising over rice, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that the rice is kind of alive, it's got steam in it. and. Yeah. You know. also kind of have a meaning like, you know, air is sort of things like very fundamental <coughs> to everything, so you're kind of using the natural resources trying to... Yeah, that's maybe. That's my interpretation. Also, I learned later that it also it some means something in Kung Fu, kind of like an anger, and I mm -hmm. thought, oh my, oh yeah. no, we called the, the company <laughs> the Angry Pixel. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that would be okay, but people say it's okay. That's very neat. Yeah, yeah that's great. And the website was available. <laughs> <laughs> So you have this great combination of technologies, you know, expertise, as well as business acumen and skills. Can you talk a bit more about the business side of things and how you've been able to establish manufacturing capability and by working with these Taiwanese manufacturers and how that was, uh, how that was established and how you continue to grow? Yeah, that was really hard. The hardest part, I mean, what's great, I think, what makes me a little bit jealous of software is software people don't have to get permission. And in order to work with these factories and get these resources, you have to get permission. So you have to learn how to get permission. And you know, I'm a woman in Asia. That, like basically, um, they they remember me. That's probably they think yeah, whatever I'm saying is a joke. It'll never work. Mm -hmm. It used to be for the $100 laptop. They just thought it was so funny. They would take the meeting because it was the humor portion of their day, right? The CEO of you know Samsung would flanked by four VPs on one side and four VPs on the other side, and me, little old me on the other side of the room, explaining my new architecture and the $100 laptop. And they just thought it was so funny, and they'd point out all the reasons it wouldn't work. And then I realized, huh, this is great. They're helping with the design. So I'd write all these things down. i say, you know, we've got some answers on these, but those, these ones, mm -hmm. these ones, they're really good points. So thank you for helping. And if, I can, if we can get answers that hold water here, can I come back to you in a few months? And they'd say, sure. <laughs> and I, was, I realized that by doing that, and, and help, they actually really wanted to help. With the $100 laptop, I mean, mm -hmm. the cause was worthy, you know, transform poor kids in the developing world. Everybody's pretty much for that, particularly a lot of the executives in Asia who many of them grew up poor and know how computing changed their lives and, and believe deeply and profoundly in how it can change other people's lives. So, I was able to really, um, I used, to, I worked in Asia for a long time, but through that project, I was sort of, you know, I was the co-founder, I was leading, rather than building a factory in California, I was, I was, I was leading trying to get their resources, and was, was finally able to, and, you know, they remember me, they underestimate me, but then when you go back, they say, oh yeah, they're the ones I thought was a nut last time, what are you doing this time, it's probably fun too, and a little nutty, and, you know, so you go with that, and and you just you just try to put this incredible, solid structure under this thing that looks like a nutty idea. Because I, I just you know, even even in cultures where they stay, you know, whatever Japan, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down is an expression. They still like to break the rules. They do. Everybody wants to do in technology like the next thing. And you know you have to develop that solid structure underneath. The reason I live there, I spend so much of my time there, is during this crisis. Um, I started Pixel Chi in 2008. I got my first term sheet the week Lehman Brothers went out of business. <laughs> but VC that gave it to us didn't execute on that 
term sheet. You know, it, it's been hard, and so things are changing fast and furious. Um, our first manufacturer went bankrupt, got bought by Foxconn, you know, and that was, it was really quite d difficult. There's been a huge price fixing scandal. A lot of the executives in the display industry have gone to jail, or when they traveled to the U.S., the CEO of AUO, AUO wasn't allowed to leave for a year and a half because he was under indictment and there was no extradition treaty. Anyway, he was found innocent after all of that. But there were a lot, there's, there's all these things going on. And, uh, you know, I'm American and, you know, Wall Street's my problem, the extradition treaty, like, it's my fault, they say, because I'm American, I should fix it. And I, I just realized that I have to be there a lot of the time to talk them through, explain Wall Street wasn't my fault, I'm sorry that I'm American, and we really shouldn't have done that, and those guys on Wall Street and women in Wall Street, but, you know, I, I, I just think everything's changing for them. I'm dealing with executives that are losing, you know, $2 million every hour. Why are they talking to me? Why? What am I going to do for them? It's like, well, you've, you've already eaten all of your children, there's no more children left to eat, right? They've killed their R&D. I offer them a cheap form of R&D that really works. We ship three million screens. Might sound crazy, but here's why these will work. Give me over to your CTO. I'll prove out some of it, but we're not going to tell you all the IP, <laughs> so you're going to have to trust us. We'll show you a demo of a proof of concept or something like that. And that's, that's how I get them to continue to work with us. But the deals are always changing. Um, there's uh, some, you know, because, because the pressures are, are so great um, uh, on on those executives right now. So um, since you work <coughs> for so many years in Asia, like um, we are all sort of like engineers in the tech industry, I'm kind of curious to know like when you are doing the business in Asia, do you notice any cultural difference between doing the business in Silicon Valley versus Asia? Yeah, <laughs> so different. <laughs> Even for different countries, right? They're all so different. I think is it a lot more difficult? Or? It's just different. And when I context switch back to California, you're supposed to have kind of, well, in, in Taiwan, they'd call it arrogant. Everybody in California, <laughs> right? Where there's, um, but it's not called that here because everybody's sort of, s you know, more direct mm -hmm. is another way to describe it. Although I, I, you just need to understand and context switch between the different cultures so that mm. you, you don't come off as a wallflower to not, you know, direct enough versus, so and sometimes I have trouble, right, like especially when I, I mm -hmm. hadn't spent much time in California for like three years, and this year I've spent more time in on the West Coast more than just California, mm -hmm. but I, I got more up to date for, but like when I first came back I was a bit more uh, nuanced um, if you s rather than direct. Mm -hmm. and that's really considered quite arrogant in with people that I deal with in, in, in China and Taiwan. I think Korea is more direct. I think Japan has, you know, well, Japan's such a different, especially post-tsunami, it's just, you know, it's, a, it's really, um, it's just oh, it's also they're all different, and I, I guess in one laptop per child, every country that we went into, I mean, we're it's in you know whatever over fifty countries, they're all you know that you have to sort of figure out what works and what doesn't work. Hopefully, without th not using the trial and error method, but having somebody that is understands sort of what you're thinking and sort of can sit you down and tell you three levels down, sort of kind of a map for it, so that you can. Not offend. I mean, when I first started living in Asia, I must have offended so many people. I was walking into walls. I didn't even know they were walls, right? I didn't know that I was making people angry with me. I didn't know that, right? And I, I you know, tried to get, get forgiveness. <laughs> so, um, Mary, when you grew up, uh, um, what are the, some of the women role models for you? The, my, well, my mom, who really mm -hmm. encouraged me, and I think, you know, actually a VP at Google, who was my, uh, I met her when I started at, at MIT for grad school, Megan Smith, oh, Megan. who became my best friend, and Margaret Minsky, Margaret mm -hmm. Minsky, Marvin Minsky's daughter, and Megan Smith shared an office, and Megan was just so, you know, just this force of kind of nature, they, 
that first year they made a video of her it goes to the Lego Lego logo people that became Mindstorm. It's called Megan in Motion, and it was just oh, she was just so cool. high energy, <laughs> just doing everything, and you know, let's do it when? How about now? And so you know, we'd sleep every other day at that time, and mm -hmm. I don't know, it just opened my eyes of of like I never really thought about traveling or like mm -hmm. really. I just really liked holography, so I was sort of niche, I guess, then. And she kind of blew the doors off of that. And I think another woman like that, in, in when I focused on holography, what was really interesting is about half men and half women in holography at, at that time. Um, a lot of the women tended to be artists, a lot of the men tended to be tacky, but there was cross between both. and. And uh, a woman, Paula Dawson, who's a holographic artist in Australia, I went and collaborated with her for a while. And then, you know, I think there's people, as I, I used to teach history of science, and there's, there's all these amazing women, if you look back, that, that aren't fully recognized, but really did amazing things. And one that I really like is um, Lucia Galvani, who um, was the wife of, of Lucia Galvani who discovered basically a, a new kind of electricity in about 1790. Um, she actually observed, he, he was dissecting frogs and they were outside and there was electrical sparks. It was either a generator, or there was a, they, they thought there were these different types of electricity then. There were like five different, Ben Franklin invent, discovered one, you know, the key. And anyway, the frog's legs moved. And that meant electricity was causing our muscles to move mm -hmm. inside of it. It inspired Frankenstein, Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein, but she made the observation, according to the history, and doesn't really get correct. Galvan galvanism, galvanic, all of that comes from the Galvanis. And I think there's, there's tons of women through history that just never got, you know, the credit for what, what they, they did. It was, you know, so there were laws. So women should be like really five words of cre credit for the work they are doing? to be able to be, um, gain the recognition in office. It's interesting because the way you do that in Asia versus here is different, but yeah. I think it's very critical um, if you, to, to find a way to get credit uh, mm -hmm. for the work. And, and the way I do that, I don't know, you can talk to how you do it. I, I, I used to not do it. I didn't know how to do it. And then I realized, wow, you know, I'm just really excited when somebody gets something pretty cool to work, and I, I, I tell everybody about how cool it is, and then I just realize I should also, you know, say, I got this to work, isn't it great, you know, I'm awesome, mm -hmm. and, and then, like, really tell, and tell, you know, the other people, like, there's all these great things going on, and so it, I found it a lot easier to take credit when I, when I learned how to get, also part of it is sort of becoming a boss and learning how, you know, how to do all that, and, but in my early years, I didn't actually quite know how to do that, so I sort of, um, you know. Are there um, a lot of female engineers in your organizations? Do you do anything trying to encourage more female to enter? We do. We do have a lot of women in our company. In fact, um, our VP of manufacturing, Belfu, mm -hmm. is amazing. She brought up four different fabs in three different companies. She, she was a chemist by training, and then she went and got a PhD in psychology mm -hmm. because the decisions taken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't actually make any technical sense. <laughs> so she runs all of our fab relations and it's really great because we have to understand, you know, the space the, the, the decision makers and decision influences, influences are in because we are not their top priority. We're just always at that sort of, are we in the fab or out of fab because we're so, we're so small and we're not. So that, that's, um, you know, really key. And yeah, we have other, other um, women as well. Um, and would like more, certainly. The numbers are pretty daunting, I think, across the, across, you know, techno technical industries. Mm -hmm. It's depressing. So what sort of advice would you uh, give women to be able to rise into leadership <coughs> roles and to excel in their careers and development? Uh, advice. Um, it depends. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, if it one sentence is do the hard stuff. Just don't, you know, do the hard stuff, you know, learn it even if it's hard and, and, and 
also stay passionate about something. See if you can combine that, like whatever the field is, right? Because if you don't understand deeply how some of the stuff works, like especially the stuff that maybe you don't like, like I didn't like some aspects of what I had to, like I hated inclined planes. I just hated it. I thought it was just dumb. I grew up on a farm. I never saw once something go down in that force on an inclined plane. It doesn't actually happen. I just thought the whole thing was dumb and I had to do that for like a year for engineering school. But, uh, you know, it just seemed like I had to stick through it to, to get to the other side. You know, it's really just Newton's law and you got to learn that. But different people have barriers at different 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 times and I think basically you know if you can do that I mastered a lot of different fields because I loved holography and you couldn't actually get a degree in holography so mm -hmm. I had to learn you know vision science and chemistry and physics and math and art and you know a, a lot of different mechanics and, and a lot of different things in order to learn all I could how to program and a lot of different things so that I could make really good holog uh, holograms and then I then you realize that you know it's okay you can sort of catch up quick in a field and part of that is you have to deal with as a girl like th they're all boys right and like they can be there's you know there's this um, thing like an MIT people call people that don't know everything like brain dead and like I remember joining the holography group at MIT there was actually a holography group and everybody kept talking that in these sort of weird coded terms and there was a hologram that was made that called was called Sanjigen and it was and I didn't know what Sanjigen meant in in Japanese because it was Japanese word it means 3D and it was just happened to be the name of something and for somehow I was supposed to know what that meant and it's just like there were so many levels mm -hmm. in figuring out what the context words were where if you could just get through that it's like hazing right like it just feels like they don't really write it down and you just have to figure out a way through that and some people will help you eventually right and as long as you know you sort of help them I guess and it just I think that part's pretty hard because the assumption is that when you're coming in especially as a younger woman in mind of these or maybe it wasn't the assumption maybe I just felt it was that the imposter syndrome thing is that you must be an idiot because you don't know this stuff already like how on earth was I supposed to know the type of hologram that was called Sanjigen was like this type of hologram made this way? I mean, there's just, it's like impossible, right? So do you guys have maybe similar? <laughs> um, yeah, so <coughs> I guess I've been pretty lucky in a way, despite going to an engineering school um, at Caltech. So the ratio is three to one for engineering and even worse for double E, which was what my degree is, was in. But after a while, you just, at least for me personally, I just didn't even notice. Like right. we were all just people trying to get our degree, right? Trying to you know get our A's and whatnot, and doing research, and you don't really notice it until somebody actually points it out to you. And that's I think that's been an evolution. And of course, we're standing on the shoulders of all the women who have yeah. gone before us, and it will continue to improve. But I think it's less of an issue. I think it's trying to be less of an issue now as it was in the past, and I hope it continues to improve. I think, I, think you only know, I only noticed that I was a woman when I was in the younger years, but I used to lifeguard at the beach in summers mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. I got my engineering jobs in the summers, and I remember they'd all tell me, like, they would never work for a woman. All the mm -hmm. lifeguards I was, who were my colleagues mm -hmm. on the beach, but, um, you know, and that was the, sort of what was, what they would say then, um, but, uh, you know, it, I just, I stopped, I stopped Stop noticing, noticing and just, yeah. you know, I'm me and it's their problem and it's, I think, the more difficult, you know. Yeah. But yeah, then I that said, Middle um, East is a different story. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of feel like I grew up in a pretty, like, very lucky environment. So, because my family are pretty heavily engineering oriented. So, my dad is a physics and the optical engineer. My mom is a mechanical engineer. So, as I grew up, I never really realized that is a gender association um, to what you can do and not. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the first time I actually realized that it's probably after I graduated from the school. Uh, because one of the company I applied for that is actually putting a ratio like how many males they want to hire, how many mm -hmm. females. So that's kind of like struck me. Oh wow, they're actually putting gender with you know the position you want to fill in. So yeah, in general, pretty lucky like in terms of growing up like in a 
very supportive environment. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's time for our uh, live question portion of the session. Okay. okay. And uh, first question it comes from uh, TS in California. She asks, or he asks, it's not clear, uh, with the future of usage trend going into mobile computing with smaller devices like tablet, should OLPC become one la tablet per child instead? Well, they're they're doing they're doing that. the The laptops and the keyboards are pretty pretty useful. They put touchscreen into the latest v version of of this, which uses the same thing. And it, this thing actually does turn around. It's big. It's bulky. It's it's mm -hmm. like a brick. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is this still about like a hundred dollars per tablet? Yeah, or it's gonna be a little bit higher. Um, probably less. I think seventy five. Oh, okay. They demoed it at CES last year, year before. Got a lot of best of CES things, mm -hmm. but the question is when it goes into production. OLPC has done a very interesting experiment of actually um, airdropping uh, tablets, and they use the Motorola Zooms because mm -hmm. they charge fast mm -hmm. rather than starting a pre-production run. They only have a small number. They airdrop them into two illiterate villages in Kenya about eight months ago to see what would happen, places that there's no written language. Nobody knows how to read. The adults, no language and writing is used. And um, they wanted to see if the kids would learn how to read or what would happen. Mm -hmm. In one village, just the kids use them. And in another village, the kids and the adults use them together. Um, but the kids have learned um, a lot of pre-reading stuff, a lot of alphabet. Mm -hmm. the, the government decided the primary education in Sorry, it's not Kenya, it's Ethiopia. Primary ed education in Ethiopia is in Amharic, but secondary and tertiary is in English. And so they thought, you know, let's put English on it. In fact, sidebar, we made the first Amharic keyboard um, in, in OLPC. Nobody had ever, ever made one before. <laughs> I mean, it was just, there was a lot of firsts that we did. But tablets in, in the villages, the kids started to learn how to read. They also learned how to hack them because we had turned, OLPC had turned off the camera features because they wore down the battery really quickly. Mm -hmm. And the kids figured out how to hack around and hack Android to turn on the um, camera. So that was great. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so tablets are, 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 are very important and, you know, going forward, but different countries are picking. Every child in Uruguay has one of these. Um, the Uruguayan government has ordered, I don't know, another 100,000. About half the kids in Peru, 50 other countries, 26 different languages. So are those mainly being distributed through the go local government? Through the Ministry of okay. Education. They buy them en masse like textbooks mm -hmm. and then give them out to the mm -hmm. kids and they have a lifetime of I don't know, five years. And mm. they could be with tablets as well. Yeah. So that's the. I'm wondering, like, um, it seems to, like, uh, even like outside the developing countries, a lot of other places, kids can use laptops like this. But sure. I haven't really seen a lot of the massive adoption sure. of these laptops. I remember. Like outside the developing countries, I'm just kind of curious why. <laughs> I remember um, when OLPC, when we were started, we had our first prototypes out. And the mayor of Birmingham, Alabama, walked into our office one day in Cambridge, across from MIT. And he said, do what you want, arrest me. He was a big guy and said, arrest me, do what you ha have to. I'm leaving here with two laptops. Call the cops, don't care. Because <laughs> he wanted some for the kids of Birmingham, Alabama. He got mm -hmm. them, we gave him some laptops. Some of the other schools. But we really designed this one. It's mesh mm -hmm. networked, so you don't need a, a Wi-Fi connection. All the laptops talk to each other. We actually had to write, finish the standard for 802.11s. S stands for mesh because M was gone. But it's really, you know, it's really a super low power, sunlight readable, you know, mm -hmm. rugged uh, laptop for kids that we specifically designed uh, for the developing world. Even there's like extra screws underneath the keyboard in case, you know, the kids have to fix the screws and they can, mm. you know, fix, sorry, the laptop and the screws drop on the ground, they can't have it. So, you know, there's a lot of solutions. I mean, Chromebook might be a good solution for, you guys are at $250 right now, right? That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of different solutions mm -hmm. um, that exist now. When we started this thing, you know, eight years ago, people really thought we were nuts. I mean, the, the, what Steve Jobs said, what Craig Barrett said, what Bill Gates said, I mean, they were shocking. They were just like, they were, you know, insulting public and private derision from them. But, you know, what 
we did that was maybe m even more important than the, you know, only three million are in the field, that's not every kid, um, is change the agenda for every minister of education on the planet. Um, the job of the minister of ed education is to educate the kids of their country. It's the job of the country. And, you know, if you're living in a developing world country, and I won't name the country, but a large country in Africa, for example, a third of the teachers that are paid to show up don't show up. The next third are illiterate. You're dealing with one third of the teachers that are actually show up, try to do right by the kids, and know how to read. At that point, better teacher training doesn't solve the problem. You just realize the kids are smart, you know, when you want to fix maybe not a Google, but normal, everyday people, when they want to fix an electronics problem, they hand it to a kid, right? Because kids, they're sponges, they figure it out. You know, by definition, one or two of us in every hundred are geniuses. By definition, we say that, right? They're going to figure it out, and you have to, l the situation is so bad in so much of the developing world, you have to leverage the kids themselves. So sure, computers are also being used in the classroom, you know, every Khan Academy, you know, it's all this great stuff that's, that's happening, you know, everywhere. But we were focused on um, the developing, developing world for this, that program. Yes, that's the <coughs> only question we have on the Google moderator. <laughs> okay. Actually, I do have a follow-up question to that. Is okay. How do you take the feedback that you get on OLPC, for example, and how do you roll that into the next design or improvements for I think software? a lot of the feedback that OLPC got, and I haven't been with the organization now for four years, but a lot of the feedback that they got was on what are the tests? What are the tests show? And there was a lot of testing, particularly in Uruguay and Peru, where there were very large deployments. Rwanda, Afghanistan, Pakistan has had bigger, bigger deployments, as I understand it. And some of the feedback on the testing was, you know, sure, uh, truancy went down, community engagement went up, kids were online, but were their test scores better? In some cases, mm -hmm. they were better. In some cases, they were about the same, but. You know, the, the truth is, um, I think, I think OLPC has been um, criticized for not doing enough testing. That said, um, I think, you know, literacy rates, I think, you know, in Peru, there's like these different levels uh, they measure. I can't remember the numbers of them, but in, in villages, Peru went into places that didn't have electricity or internet or anything to deploy the laptops. and in those, sorry, something's beeping. I don't know which one. <laughs> Probably my cell phone. Um, in those places, kids, kid, there was like, you know, whatever, 90% of the kids couldn't even pass to the sort of base level, which I think that was five, four, three, two, one, call it. So there'd be nobody at level one, nobody at level two, maybe two kids at level mm -hmm. three, most of the kids at level four and five, and six months with a laptop it got to like 30% of the kids were like in level two. And so that, that was pretty pretty compelling. But yeah, I think how OLPC has reacted is sort of saying, you know, it's hard to say this. The teachers are a critical part of education, right? And so what do you do when the teachers don't show up or are illiterate or scared of the technology? Mm -hmm. Can you make the technology easy enough to use mm -hmm. so the kids can learn on their own without the teachers? And that's the grand experiment that mm -hmm. OLPC is now doing with pretty rigorous social scientists. I think they've got three different sort of, you know, great thinkers on, on how we learn to read and so forth. In, in a non-reading um, society. I think there's, the, the, there's been very little significant research done on how a culture with absolutely no reading goes to reading. So they're studying that to say, you know, how do we get around this problem of, of teachers and schools? It's, it's radical. Mm. Um, it's only part of the program. A lot of the program is dealing in the infrastructure, transforming a, a lot of schools in Latin America. But then, you know, the big problems, as I think, you know, one of the, the, the lead execs at One Laptop Per Child puts it, you know, the rich kids are the ones that get to go to school. There's 100, 200 million kids that don't even get to go to school. How do you reach those kids? 
And so that sort of takes the politics out of it. You know, they're not getting to go to school. Can we do something by them? Because we're not, you know, their life opportunities are, are extremely limited if they don't ever learn how to read, if they don't get to go to school, if they don't get access to education. And, we're and they are usually the group that's a little bit more hunger, hungry for yeah. the knowledge. So Hungry for opportunity yeah. and feel lucky so they'll work hard yeah, right. when they can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a um, long-winded answer to <laughs> yeah. the question. Okay, I think this is a wrap-up. Um, okay. Thanks, Bo Meru, for joining us today. And um, uh, I think tomorrow there is another Woman Tech Maker episode around the same time. So mm -hmm. stay tuned in and to join us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Mary Lou. Thank you, too. Vivian and Jean. <laughs>